Uh, welcome uh, to Hudson Institute. My name is Riley Walters. I'm deputy director of the Japan chair here. Uh, and today, uh, I'd like to thank you for joining us for an event, uh, Japan's Cyber and Energy Security Modernization. Uh, last year, the Japanese government released its national security strategy and national defense strategy, which I think by um, you know, all intents and purposes is very ambitious uh, given the state of affairs of both the, the region and uh, what's happening globally. Uh, and uh, in that document, in those documents, the Japanese government lays out uh, a number of new initiatives they would like to take, not just for its own defense, but of course its security interests, which are multifaceted. And so today we've got two wonderful experts here to talk about two, of, I think, the more niche topics uh, of that strategy, the cyber component and the energy component of Japan's new modernization. And so uh, to quickly give brief introductions here, to my immediate left here, we have Dr. Motohiro Tsuchiya, who is Vice President for Global Engagement and in Information Technology at Keio University and professor at Keio University Graduate School for Media and Governance. He is serving as guest editorialist of Nikkei since April 2019 and is an expert member of the Cybersecurity Strategy Headquarters of the Japanese government since February 2013. He's authored and co-authored dozens of books on these subjects and has earned his BA in Political Science, Masters in International Relations, and PhD in Media and Governance from Keio University. He received the 15th Nakasone Yasuhiro Award in 2019. Next to him is Professor Tanaka Koichiro, uh, who has held various positions as an expert in Middle East affairs at government institutions, international organizations, and private think tanks. Among them are the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan, uh, United Nations Special Mission to Afghanistan, and the Institute of Energy Economics Japan. Since 2017, Professor Tanaka has joined the faculty of Keio University's Graduate School of Media and Governance, where he teaches modern Middle East politics along with economic security. He holds a master's degree in, uh, on Persian linguistics and contributes regularly to Japanese and international news programs as a commentator. Tanaka currently serves as an extraordinary advisor at the Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry of Japan. Uh, before we give, uh, go into remarks, I just I wanted to include a third panelist on semiconductors because I believe uh, there's actually a fine line here. There's a connection between these three, semiconductors, energy, and cyber. Uh, when we look at, for example, the semiconductor uh, inter, uh, industry and future demand, a lot of the industry speculates that most of that growth will be coming through autonomous vehicles, which I think ties in closely. Uh, and new energy vehicles, which ties in closely to a lot of the energy debate. Uh, and then, of course, data. Data is, of course, going to be collected not just uh, throughout all electronics, but more and more through the use of vehicles, which has a cyber component attributed to this. Uh, the Japanese government is being very ambitious in its new semiconductor industrial policies, as well as the United States and European Union on these issues. And so it would have been nice, but maybe next time we'll have a follow-up meeting <laughs> to talk about those three. But in the meantime, why don't we start with um, Professor Tanaka uh, to begin talking about Japan's energy uh, transformation. Right. Well, thank you for the introduction, Riley. Um, well, it's really good to be here. And uh, I, actually, I believe it's my first visit to Hudson. Oh, welcome. Yeah, it's a very nice place. Now. Um, I was thinking of how I could describe the energy transition related to some kind of a security component, as well as the uh, three uh, national security documents that was released last year, late last year. And I got this idea that uh, maybe I could talk of how energy transition or transformation is included or excluded with the, uh, from the um, security strategy documents. And that would be my point today. And what I would like to highlight is that uh, even though the government, the current Kishida administration, has launched its uh, Green Transformation Int Implementation Council since July 2022, um, the, and also late last year, the security documents, three of them were released, I see very little of the elements that were, well, say, correlated to each other. And I believe that there could have been more done to it. Uh, seeing the related documents that the US government publishes, 
and also the European Union pub has published. Uh, both of them have incorporated the, well, energy transformation or slash transition into their security documents. And uh, even though the um, security documents preceded, uh, I'm, I'm, I guess otherwise, the um, energy uh, transformation and transition uh, strategy were uh, preceded the security documents, the security documents actually did not follow through to uh, have a view or some sort of a incorporation or some sort of a correlation uh, with the energy strategy. And I believe that it is sort of a, well, missed opportunity that, that I think that could be rectified or should be rectified in the new future. And basically what I really, well, I uh, was astonished to see was that even though we totally lack uh, energy resources in Japan, uh, I mean, this is a traditional deficit that we always have had. Uh, the documents that I referred to, the security strategy documents, talk about energy as the traditional energy. That Japan lacks its own resources. We rely on imports, and so we need to secure the flow, the uh, supply chain, so on and so forth. But it does not go into the details of how we should look into the new generation of energy that the Kishida administration, or even the pre uh, administration prior to that, under Mr. Suga, had outlined that there should be a green transformation based on the, secure, uh, the strategy that they have, they have announced that by 2050, Japan would meet its carbon neutrality goals. So uh, the point that I really was um, surprised and also disappointed to see was that thing. And uh, the Americans, uh, the Europeans do consider that in order to uh, upgrade their relig uh, resilience of their military capabilities, they are now looking into the new uh, set of energies rather than totally rely on, uh, relying on traditional fossil fuels. And the document that we have in hand, at least of today, does not have that component. And I believe that that is sort of a, uh, well, maybe a misunderstanding or some sort of a oversight that those who have been involved in uh, preparing this document missed uh, including it or incorporating it. So uh, I would like to well, um, give you some examples of what the Japanese have been doing over the past years. Now, I believe a lot of people have heard about the basic energy plan that the uh, successive administrations have been um, preparing. And the most latest of that uh, came out in October 2021. And four months later, the, or three months later rather, the uh, war over uh, Ukraine happened. So this was an opportunity to consider that, okay, on one hand side, on the one side, you got the um, energy strategy. The other side, you have the, well, what we call the security strategies. And the war on Ukraine actually did has a, uh, act as a, or work as a wake up call that we need to secure our energy resources, not only to sustain the economy, but also to maintain the capability uh, of the military uh, if something happens in that uh, sense. So uh, that, was, that was an opportunity. But then the government under uh, Prime Minister Kishida uh, let's say, moved on further to establish this Green Transformation Implementation Council in July last year. And since then, he had been talking about uh, restarting or reoperating the suspended nuclear power plants. And that caught a lot of attention. And by August of last year, he even started uh, talking about constructing new power plants. Uh, nuclear power plants, which was a total, say, um, taboo uh, following the Fukushima Daiichi incident of uh, uh, March uh, 2011. So uh, everything was well, moving to another direction, meaning the traditional and uh, securing the tra traditional fossil fuel on one side has now moved, shifted towards 
well, relying on or establishing or say uh, generating new types of energies. But then here is the disconnect that is happening. The new set of energies are not incorporated in the national security strategies. So uh, the interconnection is lost. And that, I believe that that is sort of a uh, deficit that we are to face if nobody uh, would take care of that in the following month or years to come. Um, maybe I have to stop here uh, and uh, that's, Let's see no, what happens. That's a that's a great point. I, uh, I you know I I had to go through the national security strategy before this, so I at least knew what you were talking about because I I, I didn't remember them talking about energy in the national security strategy at all. Yeah. I think it's only mentioned several times. Yeah. Um, and I think I, the the one quote that I pulled out from it was they the intent to maximize the use of energy sources that contribute to energy self sufficiency. That. That was basically it. Right. Um, but you're right. There's there's real, a real lack of cohesion. I would I would mm -hmm. say, um, and you know I wonder maybe uh, when we come into the Q and A we'll we'll dive a little bit deeper into this. Right. Uh, but that's really interesting. Um, up next, Chia San, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the cyber component of the national security strategy. Thank you, Riley. So I'm very happy to be back to the Hudson Institute. So I joined the panel um, before the pandemic. So. Um, uh, I'm glad to be back to Washington, D.C., back to the uh, Hudson Institute. So um, cybersecurity is moving uh, a hot topic in Japan these days. So, but, so the, our uh, discussion started uh, more than um, um, 10 years ago. So um, it was 2011. March 2011, we had a big earthquake, earthquakes and tsunamis. So I want to say thank you to American people for supporting us. So my mother's hometown is Fukushima. So we really grateful for your uh, general support. But so there were bad guys too. So after the earthquake and tsunami and so nuclear plant incident, so bad guys uh, um, sent email to government officials of the Japanese government. So it was uh, APT attack, advanced persistent threat. So um, the email uh, uh, attachment was including uh, virus. So some of the government information was stolen from the Japanese government. It was a big shock for us. And so uh, six months later, uh, after the um, uh, tsunami and uh, uh, earthquake, we found that MHI, Mitsubishi Heavy Industry, was also hacked. So MHI is the biggest military contractor in Japan. So, and they are producing a lot of technologies and um, 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 systems, uh, and they are using the American technologies too. So it was a big shock. Uh, it, it's a big wake up call for Japanese cybersecurity industry. Then, so um, 2014, the Japanese um, government made a cybersecurity basic act. So it was, basic act means the setting the uh, um, long-term, mid-term uh, goal for cybersecurity policy. And so it was good. Uh, so uh, we uh, made a one step further uh, passing the um, law. But after that, we had many, many uh, cyber incidents after that against the Japanese government, against Japanese companies, uh, or maybe some scholars in universities. Then, so uh, another big shock was the Japan Pension Service in 2015. So Japan is an um, aging society, so all the people have larger voice. So they were very surprised um, that their pension number, um, name, address, and telephone number, those set of uh, data were stolen from the uh, Japan Pension Service. So the older people say, where is my pension money? It's not stolen at all. So data was stolen, but money was not stolen. But it was a big shock for us. So the Japan Pension Service is not the center of the Japanese government, so but affiliated institution. But so the um, Cyber Security Basic Act didn't cover the Japan Pension Service. So we had to expand the cover uh, of the act after that. Then, so what happened? So in 2018, 
um, the Japanese government published national defense program guidelines we call Boe uh, Kekak no Taiko. So um, it was uh, another uh, step forward because uh, it said in the time of crisis, we can do counter strike in cyberspace. So before that, we said, so our policy is defense-oriented defense policy. So we cannot start anything, uh, um, um, operation, war, or conflict by ourselves. But the National Defense Program Guidelines of 2018 says, if somebody attacks you, you can do a counter strike in cyberspace. So defense offense is always um, uh, the, uh, uh, both sides of the, a coin. So if we can do a counter strike, it means that we can prepare for offensive uh, measures. It was a big step. But in 2018, we said it's limited to crashes. So we cannot do it in peacetime. We cannot do any surveillance activities in peacetime because we had Article 21 of the Japanese Constitution. It uh, uh, says uh, we have to respect the secrecy of the communication. Any Japanese um, intelligence agency cannot tap communication. Uh, we do not surveillance at all. So that's the biggest hurdle for the Japanese um, cybersecurity policy. So NSA, National Security Agency in the US, or GCHQ, government communications headquarters in the UK. So they are monitoring communication. And the other governments, except Japan, so are monitoring communication for safety and security of the nation. But it's not happening in Japan. It was a big problem for me. So I said we have to strengthen our cybersecurity strategy. But it didn't happen in 2018. Then, so um, Prime Minister Kishida came in. So he became Prime Minister in October 2021. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he said, right after he became Prime Minister, he said he wants to revise national security strategy, national um, defense program guidelines. And so, um, national defense program guidelines became national defense strategy, so they changed the name. But so uh, he said, we want to change the, the policy. Um, then uh, last December, December 2022, uh, um, the Japanese government published the uh, so-called three documents, three defense documents. And the national uh, security strategy says, uh, we do active cyber defense. It was a big, big surprise for me. So people use the active defense or active cyber defense in different meanings. So people have different understanding of what's going on in the cyberspace. But so um, usually people say, so active cyber defense is similar to um, defend forward of the US uh, Department of Defense. It says, so in the peacetime, they are monitoring communication of possible enemies, um, China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea. So they are watching what's going on in their networks. And so if they identify any possible um, offense attacks against the United States, so they can stop those kind of activities. That's different forward policy under the uh, uh, Defense Department. Can we do that in Japan? So we have the constitution. We cannot do that. That's what, that was my understanding. But the national security strategy says we do active cyber defense. And it should be similar level to other countries. Wow, that's a big surprise for me. I stop here. OK. Uh, you mentioned, um, for example, the limitations. Actually, actually, the last thing you mentioned was uh, uh, level to other nations' cyber capabilities. I yeah. pulled this quote from the NSS, yeah. too. Uh, it says that uh, the Japanese cybersecurity should be strengthened equal to or surpassing yeah. that of uh, Western countries, um, which is interesting to think of. But you mentioned earlier the limitations of this. Mm. 
um, Article 21 of the Constitution says that, uh, <clears throat> that the Japanese government cannot collect information on people. Um, of course, as you already mentioned as well, active cyber defense in a way requires that. You know, it, it takes um, typically private industry uh, networks, uh, which all this data is operating on, to collect and surveil that data to be able to transmit to the government so that action can be taken before any bad actors can act, right? Um, how do you necessarily see this, this uh, you know, squaring this circle, though? I mean, it, it is a, an issue that will arise, right? It, it is an issue that, that is being met. Um, uh, I understand, I'm, I'm sure there's discussions going on already in Japan about how to you know, work around this. Yeah, um, so we were discussing this problem maybe more than 10 years. And so um, people, including me, were um, um, skeptical. We can do, we can change the constitution? Probably no. And so um, telecommunication business law is describing the same thing. So in Article 4, so we have to respect um, um, uh, secrecy of communication. That's why Japanese communication providers and the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communication is also respecting uh, this um, uh, article. Then, so uh, we cannot do that. Um, even um, um, Ministry of Defense, Self Defense Forces, or um, um, National Police Agency want to do it, probably don't. That's what my understanding. But the um, second wake up fall for Japanese cybersecurity is, um, as he said, um, um, uh, war in Ukraine. So we were very much surprised. And so battlefields are connected to each other. So we say first was land, second was sea, and uh, air, um, outer space, and cyberspace. So they are connected in Ukraine. So um, Russia is um, using any methods to attack Ukraine. And Ukraine is also counter uh, in those um, um, domains at the same time. So we realize that um, cyberspace is a key to counter strike. So if we do not do anything in cyberspace, we cannot defend Japan. That was a big uh, shock for us. And we started discussing that we have to change the um, interpretation of the secrecy of communication to defend us. So that's a, a discussion going on. We don't know how to do it, how we can change the interpretation of the, those uh, uh, constitution and so uh, telecommunication business law. But we have to think about something new. Um. That's very much on the legal side. Yeah. Let's talk about, uh, for a second, maybe the capacity side. Yeah, okay. um, uh, you know, one of the things that is part of the national security strategy is this, uh, there's, there's no real intent to increase the number of SDF forces. Mm. Uh, but the national security strategy, um, I believe, mentions the, the demand to increase cyber warriors within both the SDF and MOD. Um, do you feel that Japan is lacking some of like the uh, cyber capabilities, both either technical or, or talent-wise, that other you know, well-known cyber actors like uh, Israel, for example, uh, has? Um, to be honest, we don't have enough uh, cyber warriors um, in Japan yet. So um, uh, cyber defense unit um, under the self-defense forces have um, 800 now. But the national uh, security strategy said we will, it will be 4,000 in several years. So how we can do it? How we can attract younger people uh, in this area? So if you go to the um, self-defense forces, you cannot get a lot of money. But if you go to the private sector, maybe you can raise your money more. So is it attractive to go to the um, self-defense forces? Probably not. But in that case, we have to make a coordination with the private sector, among the private sector and the government sector. So I hope 
um, the uh, private sectors in Japan and outside Japan. So um, like-minded countries uh, ally uh, U US, UK, Australia, and other countries. We have to make a wider collaboration to train our forces. So I hope it will happen quite soon. But um, we have many, many um, challenges mm -hmm. to um, visible. That is the, uh, the nature and the problem of economics. I'm an economics guy by nature, mm -hmm. but you know, every, every resource is a scarce resource, yeah. right? <laughs> There's never enough. Yeah. Um, one of the interesting things I remember uh, that the United States started a few years ago was this bug bounty program. Basically, mm -hmm. it works with private industry, and actually, it's, I think it's a, an open platform where individuals, private individuals, can come in and through like a closed network, they can essentially hunt down mm. technical problems. Mm. And I don't know if that's maybe one way Japan can solve this problem, right? If they can't grow the problem indigenously, mm. they can maybe purchase the technical capabilities. Um, anyways, that's interesting. I, I want to move back to uh, Tanaka-sensei. Um, uh, we were talking about energy, and it's it seems like Japan's trying to do two things at once. Mm -hmm. uh, it's trying to... Uh, not just transition into sort of a modern, more green energy usage, but there's also this push for self-reliance. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is, you know, the green side of this mm -hmm. is just nowhere near where it needs to be to be self-sustaining, right? right? I think, uh, if I remember statistics, uh, it's like over 85% uh, of Japan is, 85% uh, of Japan's energy usage is reliant on imports, coal, LNG, um, crude oil, mm -hmm. things of that sort. Mm -hmm. um, some, a lot of that coming from, for example, uh, close partners like Australia, mm -hmm. but also from the Middle East. And so Correct. how do you sort of think about the future mix of Japan's energy usage? Right, well, it's a very complicated issue because uh, when you read the paper, I mean, read these documents related to energy, it talks about the current states, it talks about the future, but in between, the roadmap is not clear. Okay, you can well, draw a picture, you could draw a line, uh, you could draw a chart, but uh, in reality, now, how, how possible would it be to either procure these kinds of energy or, re, uh, or to expand the capacity uh, of such energy uh, resources? And that is going to be the biggest problem and challenge that is going to haunt us uh, for the next decade or so. Now, uh, the government is committed to reduce the uh, GHG emission by 47% against the 2013 level by 2030, which I believe we are not going to make it any, uh, in any sense possible. Even if uh, by the summer additional, well, maybe 10 nuclear reactors are to be rebooted, that doesn't still meet the uh, target by 2030. And uh, not only about that, we are trying to, well, well, um, how to say, develop uh, other resources or tap into other resources such as uh, mega solars uh, or uh, offshore wind farms. And it's going to take time. And also it doesn't really mean that uh, all these new set of uh, renewable energies are going to solve the problem itself. So uh, the other part of the, uh, the, the clue or the um, answer would be that, okay, we will still be importing a large amount of fossil fuel. Uh, liquids will be coming from the Middle East. Now, last year, uh, like 96% of oil came from the Persian Gulf region which was extremely high, but also the highest since the 1980s or even re, uh, prior to that. And all those, say, um, uh, well, policies that have been, implement, but been implemented or at least have been published in the past uh, to say with under the banner of we need to re uh, reduce our dependency on oil coming from the Middle East, never happened, never happened. And now we're talking about reducing GHG emission by 2030 and by 2050, the carbon neutrality. 
And okay, well, that's the sort of a commitment that made the government made to the international community. But um, I hardly can see any sort of a, uh, say, um, achievement uh, that would be uh, that would follow uh, in this regard. Now, uh, nuclear power plants, yes, well, that could relieve some of the uh, deficit that we have, at least on the side of um, electricity. But that doesn't mean that, okay, the F-15s, F-35s are going to fly. They still need jet fuel, A-1. So, and also the tanks, uh, again, and well, so a lot of things that we, I mean, the military uh, consumes are still fossil fuel. And that, in that regard, even though the U.S. documents, the European documents, talk about how to, say, upgrade the efficiency of the consuming side, from the consuming side, the Japanese document hardly talks about it. What, I mean, the third document uh, published December 2022 was the defense buildup uh, program or plan. And what is really stated in that is only about how to use energy as a weapon. Directed energy weapons, laser, high power energy weapons like lasers, and of course, uh, secure and uh, stockpile fossil fuel, I mean, like kerosene and all those other things. And uh, having the ability to refuel the jets in mid-air. So it's about how to use the conventional energy resources. But it doesn't, it stops short of considering some sort of a technology uh, advancement to reduce the consumption itself. It never is paid attention to that. So as you said, uh, Riley, I mean, uh, we are after so many things, but the problem here is not that we are trying to achieve a lot of things at once uh, with only maybe two hands at, at that in our, uh, in our um, disposal, that uh, none of them, maybe some of them could be inter, say, connected, and that we could have a more efficient way of solving the problem, but it doesn't really look into that sort of a uh, capability. And that's my understanding. Yeah. Sure. Um, well, how, how do you assess how other countries are thinking about this? Because I know there's right. good dialogue on, like for example, various battery type usage, hmm. um, things of that sort. Uh, have you, have you been also looking at what other countries have been doing in this space? Well, yes, but um, the current, say, uh, well, um, what we call the military buildup or the military machinery that the, uh, our self-defense forces use, your military uses, or the Europeans or even the NATO use, or even the Russians and the Chinese use, with certain amount of exception, most of them still do rely on the conventional fossil fuel. And of course, there could be some, say, innovation and technological development to follow, but uh, batteries are not that suitable in most cases because they are heavy, and that reduces a lot of advantages that maybe aerial bombers hold or possess or even UAVs possess. So, I mean, we need to just wait for another decade or even more so that the new generation of batteries could be, say, really oper becoming operational. Uh, two two la quick questions, last questions about energy. One, uh, we've talked a lot about nuclear, mm. and uh, you said, you have mentioned already the Kishida administration has talked about restarting nuclear. And I wonder what sort of signal that could tell the rest of the world who is, mm -hmm. I think there's still general opposition to nuclear in various parts of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and then two, you can't talk about Japan and not talk about hydrogen. Right, <laughs> right. I wonder maybe if you give your two cents on hydrogen. Okay, well about the nuclear thing, I think it's the, uh, well, any government in Japan 
that has some sort of a consideration or a reservation over the restarting of nuclear power plants was mostly about their domestic, uh, say, opposition. And for the past two winters and also last summer, uh, the Japanese public were really facing not only the spike in energy prices or utility prices, a real shortage of energy, a real shortage of electricity that there may be a total blackout in major cities like Tokyo. And that really frightened the public. And ever since uh, that happened or that came close to reality, the public sentiment, meaning the op strong opposition that uh, existed following the Fukushima Daiichi of 20, uh, 2011 uh, eroded. And today, uh, most of the polls that the uh, newspapers or news outlets or media conduct do show that a uh, majority is now in favor of rebooting the nuclear power plants. But still, there is a reservation. Now, are we to construct new power plants? Are we to extend the lifetime, life cycle of the originally 40 year designed nuclear power plants to 60 or even beyond that? That's another set of questions. Uh, we haven't actually dug into it yet. But at least for the moment, to say rectify the possible um, power shortage or to uh, reduce the possibility of facing that sort of a crisis, the public is now generally moving towards in favor of the nuclear power plants that exist up to date. And that's my answer. Um, hydrogen, yes, um, but yes, uh, well, it's, it's a catalyst. I mean, it's not itself, it, it doesn't exist anywhere close to us as H2 or as hydrogen as a molecule. Uh, we need to produce it, uh, generate it using something, and that itself is going to consume energy. And that hydrogen itself, when, when it's used, uh, when it's burned, of course, yes, the emission, out of the emission of H2 comes water and nothing else. But uh, storage is difficult, handling is difficult, and the types of, um, how would you say, the, cell, uh, the uh, storage cells that requires is extremely expensive and heavy. And so um, it won't be, say, that cost effective, and it won't be, uh, say, um, um, productive to use uh, hydrogen in the manner that we use uh, gasoline or, uh, or even um, natural gas, it's going to be extremely difficult. And we haven't found any sort of a, I say, um, advanced technology to, uh, to say, uh, get rid of those old set of problems uh, when we come to use of, when we come to really have to use uh, energy, uh, hydrogen as an energy resource. Uh, last question to you, Tsuchiya Sensei. Yeah. Um, what kind of keeps you up at night on, in cyberspace? I mean, so if I can just give a quick background. Mm. Uh, you know, I used to watch uh, cyber, cyber incidents, right? Mm. Breaches, uh, leaks, things like that. And uh, I used to create this list. And it, it got to the point where I just, I couldn't do it anymore because it was just, there were so many, right? You talked mm. about earlier how the Japanese pension fund got hacked in people's mm. names. and numbers were reported, that happens almost on a daily basis, yeah. uh, you know, for everyone uh, here in the United States and elsewhere, mm -hmm. uh, to the point where it's almost become commonplace. Mm -hmm. uh, so I feel like we've moved past that level of uh, security, I guess, as almost a normalization. Mm -hmm. What is sort of, what do you see as like the future, um, not things to become normalized, but things that kind of keeps you up, that concerns you that, Maybe if they do become normalized, that's a real problem. But uh, incidents that, you know, if, if we lose in this cyberspace, um, there's, there's going to be a real problem. Yeah, thank you so much for the great question. So um, I'm worrying about cognitive space, okay. so inside our head. Mm. So I, as I said, so land, sea, air, outer space, cyberspace. But now we are adding sixth one. Mm. So that's the cognitive space. 
So because um, cyberspace, we are dependent on so much. So younger people are always looking at uh, social media every day, every time. So my son is using YouTube and other things 24 hours. No, it's not too much. But so uh, he's dependent on that. And they, so younger people are getting out of data uh, information um, uh, interpretation through information technologies. If somebody is trying to manipulate your understanding, that's a nightmare for us. So um, uh, cognitive warfare is happening already. And so people talk about IoT, um, uh, Internet of Things. But I'm worrying about the Internet of Brains, mm. Internet of Bodies, Internet of Our Behaviors. So IOB might be a next one. Mm. So um, possible enemies can try to um, manipulate our understanding, manipulate our common sense, and manipulate our knowledge and philosophy and our values. That's a big shock for me. So it might happen in cyberspace. It might be happening in cyberspace oh, now. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Misinformation's prolific. Yeah. Disinformation happens all the time, uh, for sure. I mean, I absolutely agree. Uh, well, thank you both uh, for joining us today. And thank you all for joining us online. Uh, uh, I hope we can have you both back at, at another point, maybe not as long as four years, maybe something a little bit sooner. Um, uh, again, thank you all for joining us, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.